<laughs> Omar, you all have it hard. Lots of pressure. You go to our trainings with like a hundred people. <laughs> okay. You'll be lucky if you can get something on the board. So examples of gendered la language. Hey guys, ladies, freshmen, freshmen, man, yeah. dude, gentlemen, ladies, guys and gals, sir, madam, man, um, chicks. Chicks. I always chicks. find it funny that chicks is gendered, but peeps isn't. Right? Okay. <laughs> Something to do with the marshmallow, I'm not sure. <laughs> Husband, wife, sister, brother, Mr., Mrs., um, even just our day to day pronouns, using he pronouns or she or, um, yeah, boys, girls. There's so many. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah. Boyfriend, girlfriend, True. wife, husband. He, she, those aren't on there. And when a baby is born, what's one of the first question that questions that people ask? What's his gender? What's his gender? gender? Which what are they really asking? He's a boy or girl. Which what are they really asking? <laughs> what's at the root of that in our society? What's in the baby's pants? Right. Oh, we okay. want to know. Does the baby have a penis or a vagina? Right. <laughs> well, I was going to ask you guys that because the new the new thing of yeah. parenting. Mm -hmm. is not to label the child anymore. Not even with their clothes, not with their names, not with... I mean, that's just the way society is going to be going now. Whether you're, yeah. you know, straight, gay, lesbian, it doesn't matter anymore. It's just going to be Joe, Betty, Maverick, wh wh whatever your name yeah. is, is going to be that's how you want to be known, basically. Yeah, and the idea of that is coming from a place of keeping it open so that the person can navigate on their own. Because there are all these cultural and like expectations. Um, you know, having a baby girl and putting her in a pink room. Have, do you rem do folks remember when Toys R Us had like the boys' aisle and the girls' aisle, and you go down the girls' aisle and it's all pink? Yeah. And you have all the dolls and all the dresses and the cooking sure. sets and the dishwashing sets mm -hmm. and all the things that we were talking about earlier. And then you go down the boys' section and it's Legos, like learn how to construct something. Tonka toys. Tonka yeah. toys. Yeah. 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 Things like that. One thing that's always been particularly frustrating to me is that everybody seen Mulan? Bits yeah. and pieces of Bits it. Bits and pieces? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So. <laughs> I won't go into the details. You should definitely watch Mulan. Okay. Um, There's a new live action one coming out, so you can wait. <laughs> you can wait. <laughs> they have to keep that patent up. Um, so, yeah, with Mulan, if you go to Toys R Us, at least, I don't know if this is still true, but at least like five years ago this was true, and you try to find a Mulan doll that isn't in a dress, it is impossible. It is so hard to get a Mulan doll that isn't in a dress, even though she hates, like, she does not like dresses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. right? Like, yeah. what? But, but that's such a good example of the sort of cultural standards and how they're put on people. It just made me think of the term yeah. tomboy. Yeah. You know, when you're like, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Mm -hmm. and, and another important point about like that conversation, which you could have literally a two-hour training just on that, yeah. top, in deconstructing childhoods. And, yeah. Like, <laughs> I'm sure. I have, and it was great. <laughs> And, um, but a good point about that is just that when we're looking at those histories with women, the things tended to be about things around the home and the, the guys items tended to be about working. So there's this, if you're learning how to work and do things outside of the home, there's a level of independence that goes along with that. And anyways, it's all interrelated to LGBTQ plus identities. Um, what are some examples of gender neutral language? Like looping back. <laughs> We've got a huge list. Any favorites? Y'all. Y'all. Y'all means all. Folks. Folks. Yeah. What's our team called? Everyone, people, patients, friends, team, I'm hard, colleagues. I'm having a hard time reading the ones at the bottom, like under peeps. Uh, <laughs> peeps is my personal favorite. <laughs> Dearly beloved. Oh, that, that one I Dearly haven't heard, heard before. Dearly that's, beloved. That's, that's cute. Uh, partner, spouse. Sibling, family, uh, what else? 
yeah, there's, there's gender neutral options out there. We just have to kind of think about them more and be aware of when we are using gender language. And we don't know people's genders necessarily. Like when we're in a large room full of people, we don't necessarily know their genders, right? Or what pronouns they use. If we hadn't asked you, I wouldn't necessarily know yours. Um, sure, people make assumptions and they might be correct a lot of the time, but the times when we're wrong, it's really impactful. Uh, so we'll actually do an exercise on a little bit about that. Do you go ahead and move? Thank you. Um, so moving on, we're gonna talk a little bit about some themes that come up in language that might be offensive or that might, they might just have a history that's kind of icky, if you will. Um, so what I've, I've tried to simplify it, because when we're looking at these independent words, it can feel like, okay, what the heck is going on with language? So many things have changed so quickly. How do I keep up on this? So some themes. One is a movement away from sex-based language when we're talking about trans identities. So what I mean by that is you might have noticed that instead of saying transsexual or saying sex change, people are saying transgender or saying uh, people who are seeking gender-affirming care. The reason for that is because the word sex focuses on what was assigned to somebody at birth, so what somebody else put onto them, and gender focuses on the way that somebody identifies and sees themselves. With that said, you may end up working with somebody who does identify as transsexual or does, like, does use that language. If they're using that language for themselves, great. That's totally fine in those interactions. And generally speaking, um, using transgender or gender affirming care is the safer way to go. All right, and next, avoid terminology related to histories of medicalized identities. Now what I mean by that is in the DSM or the Diagnostic Statistics Manual, there have been a number of terms that have been used to say that somebody is sick because of being gay or um, being trans. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the history of the DSM. So homosexual was rooted in literally diagnosing somebody as a homosexual in the DSM and diagnosing them as sick. Same with transvestite and gender identity disorder. Uh, so transvestite, fun fact, there's a lot of confusion about that. People still think of it as like a, more of a, dare I say, fetish, or like a erotic sort of thing. Drag queen situation? Um, different. different. Different, but we can unpack drag. I'm sure Taylor can tell you about drag queens if, if you're up for it. Totally. Um, drag, I like to explain it as a gender performance. Um, so it's really heightened. Uh, when we were talking about the ways that we perform gender on a regular basis, um, kind of poking fun at that. So when we think of drag queens, it's a very like exaggerated makeup, huge hair, um, tall heels, all of the things that we put on women of like, you're supposed to have a blowout and hair extensions, and you're supposed to wear makeup all the time, and you're supposed to walk on stilts because everyone knows how to do that. <laughs> um, and then, then on the other end, when we think of folks who identify as like drag kings, really what do we put into being a man and that machismo like full abs which are actually it's still just makeup um, <laughs> yeah, and like the way that we dress very suave um, and so the difference when we think of transvestite it's really focusing on things that happen in the bedroom um, versus drag which is definitely out there for everyone to see performance yeah i know even this saturday middlebury had a drag queen story hour at the library so <laughs> I missed that. Um, yeah, and so with the word transvestite, I'm debating if I'm going to go down my rabbit hole. <laughs> uh, the, the brief version is it's a highly misunderstood term. It was a term that a lot of transgender people ended up getting put under historically because it makes sense. Uh, if you think, if you kind of break it down, if you're a trans person and you're not comfortable physically in your body and you're finally expressing yourself in a way that's comfortable, it might make sense that you might enjoy sex more if you're dressing yourself in a way that's comfortable. So historically, a lot of transgender people were diagnosed as transvestite, even though that's not something remotely close to how they might identify today. And with that said, there are some people who do identify as transvestites, right? As that, their own unique thing. Um, Anyways, moving on. Gender identity disorder is the term that we used to use in the DSM for trans people. Kind of, it came after transvestite as 
something better, uh, but still not great. It was still saying your gender identity is a sickness. And so what we do differently now is we have the diagnosis of gender dysphoria, which basically says that that gender dysphoria focuses on the experience of congruence with your body and with gender. So if you're experiencing a disconnect between your body, like a disassociation almost, that's not good, like that doesn't feel good. And it focuses on that disconnection being sick and not your identity. Um, so with that said, yeah, that's pretty good. Does that make sense? So, please don't add ing, ism, i's, ed, s, or s's to transgender. So what I mean by that is when folks aren't quite as familiar with talking about um, trans identities, it's really easy to say like, oh, somebody's transgendering or transgenderism. I don't quite understand transgender eyes as much, but there's a lot of fun jokes you can make about that. Oh yeah, the gesture. Um, uh, there was a trainer that I went to once where someone asked, like, how do you transgenderize? And I have no idea. Um, but in 2020, I am planning this like trans jazzercise program called <laughs> Transgenderize. Um, I think I will have to like give them some money for that one. <laughs> they branded it themselves. I love it. It's great. Wait, are you actually doing that? Maybe. Oh my god. I'll say later. Um, anyways, transgendered, transgenders. Transgenders? Question mark? <laughs> Not sure. Anyways, basically people just use a lot of different language when they're trying to talk about trans people because it's uncomfortable and they're not sure exactly how to frame it. Those are all things that you can kind of clear, clear away from. Uh, transgender, do you want to flip two slides actually? Yeah, thank you. So transgender is an adjective. It goes before, so a transgender person or a person who is transgender. It's a description of a human being or a, a component uh, of them. And then another clarification to make is when we say trans man versus trans woman, some people don't actually understand what we mean necessarily. Uh, so I always make sure to unpack that here, just in case. So when I say transgender man, what I mean is a person who is assigned female at birth who identifies as a man. So a trans man, basically what it means is um, Trans is the adjective describing man, which is how they identify, not what they were assigned at birth. So a little clarification, and then we'll go back. <laughs> okay, words to watch out for, yay! This is the part where I always get hungry because I think about lunch. Um, so choice, lifestyle, and preference literally are what I think about when I think about what I like to eat. Because it's, it's what I like, it's a choice, it's a preference, it's my lifestyle, if you will. Um, so if I'm thinking about, do I want that double bacon cheeseburger, maybe with jalapenos from Handy's down the street, that's really greasy, or do I want maybe the frozen burrito that's in the fridge because I'm trying to be economical. Um, that is a choice, right? I might have a preference in that decision, but it's my lunch, so it's a choice or a preference. And lifestyle might be how many days a week am I getting that double bacon cheeseburger or whatever. Uh, but when we're talking about identities, it's more than just choice, lifestyle, or preference. So when we're talking about what pronouns somebody uses or their sexual orientation or their gender identity, it's, it feels bigger to them than their lunch. So it can feel minimizing to use those words um, in association with sexual orientation or gender identity. And then the next little block here is real or is really actual or actually or born as. Um, usually people use that language when they're not sure how to talk about trans people again. Um, so again, you can literally say trans man, trans woman. You can use that language typically, if, as long as that's a language they're using for themselves. Um, but real or is really actual or actually or born as kind of feel like they're weaving around uh, honoring the way that the person identifies. Um, and it, it can feel uncomfortable or blatantly rude. Uh, like a, a trans woman is actually a woman. She is a woman, period. Uh, and it can feel really invalidating to suggest otherwise. Even if that's not your intent. Uh, and born as specifically comes up in medical settings a lot. It's really easy to kind of start using that language. So just steering away and trying to say, if, you, if you're trying to get at that, 
you can say a person who is designated male at birth or assigned male at birth. So when you say that they're designated or assigned, what you're saying is somebody else put that label on them. And so that, that's why that language is generally used. And then I couldn't, could or couldn't tell. So when somebody says, I could tell you were transgender, I could tell you were gay, bi, whatever, um, that might be scary. That, is, that might follow somebody into the bathroom. Like if, if they're in the bathroom and they're just minding their own business, they might be afraid that the person next to them might be able to tell that they're trans and they might be afraid that they might get assaulted, um, which is a reality. So being cautious of telling somebody that you could tell could just be kind of rude and scary. Um, and then I couldn't tell. Generally, people even sometimes mean this as a compliment, but there's this and sometimes it lands that way, frankly. And with that said, there's this underlying message that it's not beautiful to be trans, like that you shouldn't be able to tell if you're trans. And that ignores that there's a lot of people in this world who identify as non-binary, or there's a lot of people who, you know, their day-to-day their -day state of being, it might be visible in that sense. Um, and that should be beautiful. Right. These are humans. Um, and then fully transition. So the reason that this is included on here is because it comes along with this myth that if you are a trans man or a trans woman and you're going through medical procedures to get gender affirming care, that you have to do, it, it's like completing a test. You have to do all the different pieces and then you're done. Congratulations. You're done. You fully transitioned. And for some people that might be true, but for a lot of people not necessarily, because surgery is really expensive. You all probably know that better than me. But like five for trans people, surgeries can cost five to ninety-five thousand dollars each, um, or more, depending on what surgeries there are. Uh, some are more reasonable, so to speak, but they're still a lot of money. Like you had ninety-five thousand dollars, what would you put? house <laughs> you know there's that's a lot of money um, and with when we're thinking about hormones and why somebody might go on hormones or might not hormones are kind of scary if you're 70 years old do you want to have puberty again maybe but that's a huge huge life uh, occurrence I guess um, and so there's a lot of reasons why somebody may or may not go on hormones or may or may not have surgery and that doesn't make them any less trans. Um, it could be a factor of safety or money or medical access, feeling safe interacting with their medical providers, etc. Um, and people may also just not want those things necessarily because it is such a huge thing for your body. Uh, next slide please and then again I guess. Around the pronouns. Any questions about language stuff or any other language things that you're wondering? Cool. I'm impressed that we're like we're very much so on time right now. Which is good. Okay. Um, there's my challenging assumption slide. I just uh, <laughs> moved around. Uh, so let's get into pronouns. I have a sheet that I just passed out to y'all. Um, that has the most common pronouns and tips and tricks on there. Um, people feel really confident, typically, with the binary pronouns that we know, so she, her, hers, he, him, his, for folks who identify as feminine or masculine. And then where we start to trip up is when we get to they, them pronouns. There is this initial thought of they, them, I learned in school, it's plural and only plural, you can't use it in a singular sense. Um, the good news for all of you is that every dictionary has come out to say that they, them pronouns can be used in a singular sense, and not only can it be used, we have been using it for years and years and years. So for example, if you had left this room and left your water bottle behind, I would say, oh, they left their water bottle, I hope they come back to get it. I'm talking about one person, one water bottle, and hopefully not many people are using that water bottle because then we'd have to talk about bacteria and people sharing, that's germs, we don't like that. Um, but they them pronouns is difficult in the sense that we have to make our pronoun use uh, conscious. What I mean by that is a majority of the time when we're entering into sentences and having conversations, it just naturally flows out. It's an unconscious flow. 
Um, and we use pronouns so that we don't have to say a name over and over and over again. And so when we're identifying someone with pronouns outside of the binary he or she, um, we have to take that extra second to make sure that we are using the correct pronouns for that person. Some tips and tricks that I have is one, uh, try practicing using they, them pronouns for the people around you. Uh, even if you know their pronouns, it's a great way to practice because the majority of the time, because it's gender neutral, it will go in one ear and out the other. Um, it's also really helpful to use whenever you're first meeting someone, um, especially in a conversation, just using they, them pronouns is a wonderful practice to help incorporate it into your language moving forward. I will also highlight that on your sheets there's minus18.org, which is an online platform that you can practice using pronouns and conjugating them in sentences. Um, and because robots don't have feelings yet, it's a great one to practice with. Another one that I will highlight on there is zezemzer pronouns with the X. Um, another pronoun for someone who may not identify with the gender binary, it is, again, less common, which is why we don't have it on the main slide here, but something that you may come across. And minus18.org would be a great one to help incorporate that into your language. Another practice is just using someone's name. Um, I am really terrible at memorizing people's names, but this may be a great way to start learning them. Um, and it really helps if you're worried about uh, messing up someone's pronouns, using their names in the beginning um, as you start to get comfortable and then incorporating pronouns uh, later on in that conversation. When we get to the slide, a majority of folks ask like, well, how do I even ask someone for their pronouns? Um, and I'll give you two uh, hot tips on that one. One is, today we started off this presentation by introducing ourselves with our names, pronouns, and title. And the majority of the time when we're working with new patients or clients, we are already introducing ourselves with our name and title so they know exactly what the purpose of that meeting is. So adding pronouns into that would actually open the door for that patient to share their pronouns with you. Um, and it also offers the opportunity later on in the conversation to bring up pronouns again. It's something that you are mindful of, and then you can ask, oh, I'm sorry, I don't uh, know what pronouns you'd like for me to use. Um, which ones? Or just flat out asking, what pronouns do you use? Or what pronouns should I use for you? Um, same with name or gender identity. Uh, big piece there is moving away from the how do you identify, which is a very broad question, and getting more into the specifics of what information you're looking for. So if we say how do you identify, someone may identify as like a vegetarian or a vegan, and that is not the information that we're looking for in that uh, sense for that day. Uh, yeah. Any questions on these pronouns? Well, we're going to move into a video. Um, has anyone heard of the One Cup series before? Highly recommend if you're ever looking for a YouTube poll to go down. The One Cup series brings uh, folks together who have or share a similar identity. So in this case, we are, have a video with transgender and gender non-conforming folks coming together. And they are asked about the word pronouns and what their reaction is to that word. And so we'll be able to see the breadth and depth of experiences that folks in the trans and gender non-conforming community have around pronouns, and understanding that today when we're covering best practices, we're focusing on how we can support the majority of folks. Um, and I'll explain that a bit why when we get into it afterwards. You can call me he, you can call me she, you can call me Regis and Kathy Lee. Simple. Pronouns are not hard, but people's understanding of them apparently is. Simple. Simple. And I just feel like I'm not stabbing myself in the leg every seven days with testosterone for them to call me she. Respect. I think it's always important to ask someone what they use, what honors them, and to use that. Gender, the way people look, isn't necessarily uh, descriptive of who they are inside. Difficult. As someone who considers themselves non binary, I have a lot of trouble 
interacting with people who've never interacted with someone who uses uh, they, them pronouns. When people hear that I use he, she, and they pronouns, I think they get a little bit nervous because what if they start using one pronoun and then they say a different pronoun in the next sentence, then everyone will think they messed up. He, she, it, they, it does the word. I don't like it when people call me a he. I feel like they need to be corrected right on the spot. When someone knows about my validity and chooses a pronoun that resonates well with me in the moment, a key to educate oneself about who you let into your life and how they want to be identified. Useful. If anything, I'd be more hung up on the on the the need some people feel to attach preferred that can give people an inaccurate idea of what being trans is because my pronouns aren't preferred, they just are because my gender is not you know, a desire that I have or like a wish or something, it's who I am, it's just part of me. Useful. I mean, it's, it's easier to talk to somebody when they know how to address you. Feel good about pronouns. Feels great to have the ability to choose your own pronouns. Constant. That is a thing that I constantly have to fight for. All my friends and family are on board, so I don't have to worry so much. But I always worry about what pronoun strangers are using for me in their heads, which is really just a silly thing I should not even be thinking about. Individuality. Given yeah, they might not know how to address you unless you tell them, or if they ask and you answer them. Uh, I would say patience is so the way I think of. When somebody miss, you know, uses my pronoun, I don't get angry, I just re-correct them and help them really understand, you know, the importance of um, how misusing somebody's pronoun can be offensive. Identity. And you better get it right. In the workplace, people who persistently misgender you are actually guilty of sexual harassment. So what's more important? How you see me or respecting how I see me? That last comment kind of really pissed me off. <laughs> yeah, we get that quite a bit. What would you mind saying a little more about that? Well, because in the medical field, we have these sheets called face sheets, and it tells us what the gender is. So to have that pronoun just come out, it isn't like we were saying at the beginning, not to be offensive. It's just, it's there. Legally, it's right there in front of us. Okay. And then they're throwing a legal consequence at us when legally the sheet says what it says. Right. So why do you think that person was angry? Because their internal dialogue is, is, is beating themselves up because of what other people are saying about them. Yeah, maybe to some extent. Um, generally, people have had these experiences so many times in their life, they've ran into those, those barriers and those boundaries over and over and over again. Um, and it can be super hard and it's easy to feel angry and it makes sense to feel angry, right? Like, uh, the, going back to the suicide slide, like, people are killing themselves. Um, people should be angry. And that comment was very specific to in the workplace, so if you are an employee and let's say that, um, so I'm a trans man, and I, I literally am, and at my work, if I was being misgendered every day, if somebody was saying Skylar and referring to me as a she, that is rude, it's making an unsafe work environment, um, and that, that is something that under the Attorney General's office would be interested in in the state of Vermont. If, if an employer is making an unsafe work environment and isn't stepping in and intervening, like for example, if that was happening, having this training come in, that would be an action that would be in the step in the right direction. But if somebody is not taking steps to prevent continued harm, that's enabling discrimination and it's leading to people being homeless or unemployed. Um, yeah, so that's really what they were getting at, is like that persistent misgendering. And with patients, it's a, it's a little bit different, and it's still really important. And they might be angry. Um, so you talk about tone policing earlier, by chance? Okay. 
So because we missed the challenging assumption slide, we, we typically talk about this at the beginning, uh, but when, when people have been misgendered or they're hurt or offended, they might be angry. And we, if we're going to this, this training and we want to learn like best practices on how to respond to that, is to hear it and to make space for that and to honor it and to know that that experience is so much bigger than that one interaction. So it's not actually about you or that one individual mistake, it's about a world of her.